Repeat after me, true riches. Now, our text is a, is a, I won't spend much time reviewing today. It is a, it is a fight that the Lord is having with the church at Laodicea. He's, he's, it is, it is as though he's throwing water in their face. Um, picture it this way. It is the battle that a parent would have with a child when she knows that her child can do better. Amen. A good parent doesn't scold their child for what the child simply cannot do. This is why a parent has to be realistic in their assessments of their child. If your son is not athletic, you can't try to make him an athlete. Uh, you, you, you find out what his bent is, and then you encourage that. It could be that he's a little genius. Amen. He just can't run fast. Praise the Lord. It could be that he's anointed to be the next Einstein, but you're trying to make him LeBron. Now, now you're the problem. See, but when, when you, um, you, you know your child, or, or you should, and you know when they are doing their best, and if the best that your child can produce at a given point is a C, don't rebuke them. And scold them for that C. If you know that that C uh, was the result of their best effort, you ought to celebrate that C. You ought to treat that C like it's an A. For in celebrating the C, the C will become an A eventually because you're celebrating them where they actually are. Nothing wrong with encouraging them to do better, but there's nothing as deflating, there's nothing as disheartening uh, as after you put forth your best effort and you've done your best, then someone waves your best off as though it is nothing. That doesn't encourage you, that doesn't, doesn't inspire, that is quite discouraging. But when you know that your child can do better, then you don't celebrate them falling beneath their best. Praise the Lord. You, you do what you have to do within reason to encourage them to do better. And even in that, uh, you do it the right way. You, you should never, uh, good parents don't, don't discipline their children. Uh, don't, you don't break their spirit. Amen. You, you can correct them, but you don't want to break them. And you never discipline them when you're angry. Because when you're angry, you'll go too far. And when you're mad, you might kill them. Mad means you're not thinking. See, and, and you don't need anger when it's time to be punitive. You know, when you, wanna be, when you want to punish them for what they deserve to be punished for, it's not necessary for anger to be present. It's more necessary for love to be present. And you still do what needs to be done and get through to them. But you are under control. Say amen. amen. We have a parent. We have Jesus here. Arguing with the church at Laodicea. He's not fighting against them. He's fighting with them. He's fighting for them. He's telling them uh, who you are and what you've settled for is beneath praise the lord it's beneath you you are you have settled for being nothing you are lukewarm you're not 
alive and you're not dead. You're not fast and you're not slow. You're bland. You're vanilla. You, you are colorless. You don't smell good and you don't smell bad. You are odorless. You are ineffective. And you're satisfied. Praise the Lord. You're satisfied. You, 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 you're right. You haven't said the wrong thing. But, but you're wrong because you didn't say anything. And you got to know the difference. You got to know when it's time to say something. And then when they know what to say. He's chiding with that church. And remember the church. The seven churches from one school of thought represents the seven uh, epics that the church, the body of Christ would go through leading to the coming of our Lord. And if that be the case, then the church at Laodicea represents the age, the last age of the church, the times in which we now live. Others believe that the seven letters were epistles and they should be read and studied without any prophetic implication whatsoever and read them for their instructive value. I personally believe that both uh, uh, viewpoints are correct for they are filled with instructions. But I do believe that they are prophetic as well. So we see the Lord throwing water in their face. We see the Lord challenging them and the thing that is motivating our Lord, as I forementioned, is love. He says in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke. How different that is from the way love is expressed uh, in modern times today. We learn from Oprah. We learn from... Uh, uh, liberals, we learn from television, we learn from the talk shows, we learn from Jerry Springer and all of the rest of them, uh, the own network and the rest, ABC, NBC, CBS, that lo love means you support a person no matter what they do. Because I love you, I may not even agree with you, but because I love you, I will support you. Well, that's not, that's not the Bible kind of love. God said, because I love you, I'll rebuke you. Whom I love, I rebuke. The Bible teaches that if we're without chastisement, then we're illegitimate. Jesus chastises everyone uh, that he loves. And he loves every member of the body of Christ. And you, may be, you uh, may be going through a season in your life of chastisement from the Lord. Celebrate it. Learn from it. Because if he didn't love you, he wouldn't chastise you. The sign of a, a lack of love in a relationship like this, parent, uh, uh, child, um, uh, the sign of uh, love, Lord, in the church, the sign of that love is missing is when you give no correction. When you say nothing. They're going off the cliff and you let them go. They're eating food that's bad for them and you let them eat. The teeth are rotting out as you hand them the next bag of jelly beans. Praise the Lord. She's three times the children in her age uh, limit, and you still, you're still pumping the potato chips, the candy bars, and everything else to them, and won't even mention uh, or even try to augment the diet. That's not love. That's child abuse. That's, 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 that is actually hatred. When you love somebody, and you see them going wrong. You can't love them and see them drinking and act like you don't notice. Child come home smelling funny. What kind of cigarette is that you smell like? Kid done got into marijuana and you don't say anything. Find a, 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 a pornographic uh, magazine or a porno website or or, 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 or a liquor bottle or some, uh, some, some kind of paraphernalia that says that they've gone into, the, they're getting into the wrong things and you pretend not to notice. I don't know what you feel for them, but you do not love them. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. The LGBTQ 
community have said that we, people like us, that we hate them, that we're homophobic because we tell them the truth. And my response is always the same. The most loving thing that you can do for a person is to tell them the truth. And sometimes love is manifested in that truth being spoken softly. And sometimes love is manifested in that truth being spoken quite roughly and abruptly. It depends on the situation. If I'm sailing down the river and I got 20 miles or 30 miles to go and the water is still soft. But there's a waterfall 20 miles down. You got time to get me to turn around. You ain't got to scream. Hey, man, you might, want to get, you might want to get off this lake, you know. There's a waterfall. But if the fall is around the bend, just, just a few yards up the street, look, you better, hope, you better hope the fall kills me because if I make it and I find you, I'm going to try to kill you for not wanting me. I'm gonna, first, I'm going to ask you, did you know that that was a waterfall? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> then you better run. <laughs> because you are, we're obligated. At that point, it's time to raise your voice. It's time to, to get the person's attention. No parent would see their child in the street playing and say, come on, Johnny, get out of the street. Oh, no. Oh, no. You're going to get them out of that street. Because why? Because you love them and you realize the danger. You don't just look the other way. And parents, don't be afraid of your children. Amen. Love them, but don't be afraid of them. Because some of these uh, 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 kids, uh, and, and, and really, really, it's, it's really all the parents. So we talk about the kids, we talk about the millennials, and we talk about these children. But, you know, we decided in the 80s. Now, I, I preached against it, but they wouldn't listen to me. I told them they were wrong. In the 80s, folk decided that Dr. Spock knew more than Jesus Christ. And Spock ushered in the time out and stuff like that. Now, the Bible says that folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Spock said no. And, and the Bible said the rod of correction. The rod of correction. Not your hand. Not your hand. Not your fist. Praise the Lord. Not a drop cord, but the rod of correction driveth it far away. Spock said, no, no rod. We're going to do time out. And even in the church, people started preaching time out. And they went with Spock instead of going with God. Now, see, it takes a minute for this stuff to manifest. See, a little knucklehead uh, uh, in the uh, 86, 87, 88, all right, uh, 1990s, all right, t t 10 years, uh, now we're 2000. Now here we are, 2017, we have a problem. We have problems. We have problems. Uh, 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 you, you, some of you have kids who talk to you and you, you don't have respect and you know I'm, I'm, I'm a warrior. I don't do good with uh, little munchkins. Uh, you, you don't know nothing. You've done nothing. You've accomplished nothing. Oh no. You, you, you can pretend, fake it, but you gonna act like you got some sense talking to Patrick Wood. I don't, I don't do that. I just don't. But no, no. Well, you, you, you can't even produce toilet paper on your own, and you got all that mouth. People got to buy that for you. Everything you have, your mom and daddy provided. Everything. You, can't, you hadn't bought a pillow, nor a pillowcase. Everything. And you got mouth? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, my parents aren't supporting me. Who bought them shoes? Well, mama did. Who bought them socks? Mama did. That outfit you have on? Well, she did that too. How much support do you need? Well, how much proof do you need? Say, so, well, I don't feel supported. Somebody's wife, my husband ain't supporting me. 
Well, who bought the grocery? Well, he bought the grocery. He bought the food. That's a part. Say amen. He might not say everything you want him to say. Now, you got quiet then. Did you see how when I turned that corner? I, I can't get amen now. Man who paid for the car. <laughs> I don't feel supported. You might, you might need to check your feelings. He may not be as expressive as someone else, but pay attention to what he does. Now, if, he, he's not, if he's not providing and he ain't saying anything, pray on my child. Make an appointment. But back, back to these children. Back to these children. Yeah, so we created this. And uh, 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 now we have, uh, have challenges. And the remedy is we've got to challenge them to do better. See? Praise the Lord. The, the cure to young men being shot in the streets and, and shot in collision with the police is not to have a meeting with the police. It starts with having a meeting with the young men and telling them stay out of that life. Now, you liberals in Raleigh, when you hear this, and some of you from my own community is gonna say, did you hear what Wooden said? Well, the late great Sheriff John Baker used to say the same thing. He would, he would come to our churches. I miss him. He would come to our churches. Sheriff Baker was 6'9", 6 6'10", 6 6 almost 400 pounds. A hulking man. And uh, you know, when Sheriff Baker came to your church and said he wanted to have words, you said, okay. <laughs> yes, sir, Sheriff. He's a sheriff and a giant. And so, put him up and he would, he would warn the kids. He said, listen, you don't want to come and get into the system. So I'm here to help you. And I want to help you by saying, stay out of trouble. Because if you get in the system, I can't help you. Once they close them doors, you're in trouble. So I want to come to you and say to you, obey the rules. Be law abiding and stuff like that. Th that message is lost now. Amen. That message is lost. And we're in a day now where everybody wants to go word for word with authority. Police says, uh, I want you to get out the street. I'm not getting out the road. Now, you, you're going you're gonna to get out the road. Because, see, he can't let you not get out the road. Uh, They're going to drag you out the road, shoot you out the road, pull you out the road, but you're getting out that road. That young man that got killed down there in uh, St. Louis would be alive today. With everything else he did, would be alive today if he hadn't have been walking down the middle of the road. Nobody, the, he would have, while the police were looking for somebody who robbed the store, the police would have, would have driven right past him with the cigars in his hand had he just been walking on the sidewalk. But no, in the middle of the road. I can't get an amen. amen. Which brought undue attention. You want to get shot? Go out there and walk down the middle of the road. Just, just stay out there long enough. You will get shot or hit by a car or something because there are rules. I don't know how, I don't know why I'm talking about this for so long. I don't know why I'm saying this. And, uh, and for those, some of these tough ones, I've seen it. I've seen it happen over and over. These tough kids who you can't tell anything. When they clean, when that door shut, they're the first ones start crying like a little pig, squealing like a baby. Mommy, 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 come get But mom can't get you now. And then after you cry and cry and cry and cry, you look back and there stands Jerome. Looking right at you, trying to, looking right at you, sizing up your behind. Because he's getting ready to make you into his little female dog bad boy don't get me started I know what some of your visitors are saying I've never heard anything like that that's the problem 
That's the, we need to tell them the truth. So in our text, Jesus is contending with the church. Saying to the church, you can do better than that. You're better. You're better than lukewarmness. You're better than being ineffective. Your lukewarmness have caused uh, you to see yourself the wrong way. He said, because you say that you are rich and increase with goods, have need of nothing. Notice the self-conceitedness. I don't need anything. The conceited. Notice the, uh, the self-delusion. The deceived. By themselves. I need nothing. I have everything that I have. And you know in verse 17 they were in trouble. Because notice uh, their opinion of themselves. And reality was as far apart as the east is from the west. And the north is from the south. Their opinion. I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing did not line up with the reality of that situation. For Jesus said, no, you're not rich. Increase with goods and have need of nothing. But you are deceived because the truth is you are miserable, poor, blind, and wretched. See, now, now, we believe it when it works for us. But we reject it when it doesn't. When it works for us. I am who God says I am. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I'm going to lend and not buy. All right? All right? If it works when you want it to work, it's work it works when, when, when you don't want it to. When the Lord says you're miserable, blind, poor, and wretched, you are. We are. If that's what the Lord says. And that's what the Lord says. Notice, notice the area of disagreement. They said, I'm all right. How many of us feel that way about ourselves today? I'm all right. I'm doing pretty good. My bills are paid. I have a good job. I have a good income. I feel pretty good. Things are going according to plan. I'm all right. But have you asked the Lord whether or not you're all right? Or have you considered that there, is, there are more levels to your existence than what you can see in the physical? See, because perhaps spiritually, they were rich. Perhaps at that time, spiritually, they had all the goods that they needed. Perhaps, not spiritually, physically. Physically, they had money. Physically, they had uh, goods. Physically, they had all of their needs met. But saints, don't settle for that. Just because you have it going on in the natural, that doesn't mean that you have it going on in the spiritual. And I'll be honest with you. Many of us have allowed our physical state to suffice for our entire being. And because we're doing good physically, we don't reach out for God. Because we're doing good physically, we don't press our way to church. Because we're doing good in the natural, we move at our own pace. But wouldn't it be bad to live your whole life monitoring and judging yourself on your physical and natural state only to stand before God in the day of judgment and the Lord say you were miserable, blind, poor, and wretched. 
Wouldn't it be something for me to think that I am all, I'm all right when in reality I'm all wrong. There have been cases where people felt wonderful. They didn't have a trauma. They didn't have a headache. It was just time for their annual physical. Felt like a champ. Felt like they were able to run a race. Annual physical. Routine. And they find a cancer in you. In this fourth stage. You're walking around feeling wonderful. Ready. About to drop dead. And didn't know it. And no matter how good you felt. The reality is. You have cancer. Reality is you're dying. But you didn't, you didn't know it. It hadn't shown any signs. Preach with me. These people let their physical state. Mm, let their physical state cause them to be satisfied in a condition that was unsatisfactory. They were on their way to hell and didn't know it. And I got a feeling with our beautiful churches and with our nice clothes and wonderful cars and the, the good things that God has blessed us with, that too many of us have allowed those things to mellow us out. Praise the Lord. To, to make us too satisfied with the status quo. You see very few people now hungry for God. We're hungry for the next blessing. We're hungry for the next goodie. We're hungry for the next material thing, but hungry for God. A, a hunger for the Lord is a thing that's seldom seen now. Here's what we're hungry for. We're hungry, Reverend. We're hungry, all right. We're hungry for you to get through. Wrap it up. We have places to go. The game starts this evening, whatever the case may be. But we don't have that hunger for the Lord. After all, why should I be hungry? I, ha I have a big car. What's to be hungry for? I have a nice house. Why should I be hungry? I have on a nice suit. Why should I be hungry? I live in a nice house. Why should I be hungry for God? I have a dime or two in the bank. Why should I be hungry? I should be hungry because nothing I just mentioned matters. You should be hungry because those things are fake. All of those things are on loan for us. To us. We're going to die and leave it all. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.